in invitation to this uh, seminar series. Uh, I feel honored to give the second seminar in this series. And uh, as Akilia said, uh, I'm very happy to take any questions at any time. I think there is no need to wait until the end. Um, so uh, just interrupt uh, if you uh, want to ask a question. I guess if uh, Akilias will maybe moderate uh, if there's too many questions, but we'll see. Okay, so um, I would like to uh, present uh, recent work that I did uh, together with uh, Kevin Wang, um, Oscar Emil Sommer and Francesco Piazza, who all were at some point at uh, the Institute in Dresden. Um, uh, Kevin Wang and Oscar Emil are summer interns um, who uh, joined this project. So Kevin did mostly the theory part, which I will present in the main part of this talk. And Oscar Emil is right now at our institute and uh, we're trying to work on an experimental verification of the theory. Um, and I will uh, share some details of this, um, which is ongoing work uh, in the second half of the talk. So the topic of the talk is uh, about uh, generic properties of random Liouvillians. I will uh, explain to you what I mean by this exactly. And the main feature that I want to investigate here is the effect of locality. So if we look at a Liouvillian, I, I'll talk about the details in a second. Um, and the only thing we put in is locality, then there is a hierarchy of relaxation time scales which emerges, uh, which is quite interesting. Um, so the, the plan of the talk is to give a very brief introduction to random matrix theory in unitary quantum systems. I mean, this is really, I'm just skimming over to motivate slightly the logic of the research we did. Um, then I will um, discuss a little bit the spectra of random Liouvillians, and then come to the main uh, thing that I want to discuss, which is the effect of locality. So if we take a random Liouvillian, but we enforce a notion of locality, then this hierarchy of time scales emerges. Um, and then in the last part, I want to give some details about our idea to experimentally verify this hierarchy of time scales. We think we see it. Okay, so um, you all probably agree that uh, quantum many body systems are tremendously complex. And this is a, a realization which was um, noticed very early on. And people, I think, over the course of, last, of the last century basically um, developed this view that um, many body systems are more, in most cases uh, chaotic. And this was uh, put on a, on a solid theoretical footing um, in terms of random matrix theory. So one example where this was, um, and this is the classic example where this was first um, found was uh, the, the case of spectra of atomic nuclei, which are strongly interacting fermionic systems. And it was uh, noticed in experiments that they have many resonances, uh, for example, in neutron scattering or uh, other, so uh, neutron cross section or other um, experiments. So here are, and this is an example from a classic review on random matrix theory, uh, some uh, neutron resonance and, and proton resonance spectra of, uh, for example, erbium or titanium nuclei. And um, if one looks at these spectra, um, one thing uh, jumps to the eye, which is that it seems that it is quite unlikely that two levels are arbitrarily close. And these levels which are very close are indicated by this arrowhead here. And uh, it was then brought forward by Wigner that maybe one can explain these spectra by comparing to the spectra of random matrices, which have exactly this property, namely that uh, the probability that two levels are arbitrarily close is very low. So this is um, uh, an example um, the, of distributions, and those are, which is quite nice, uh, those are the actual experimental data for neutron and proton resonance spectra of these two um, uh, examples here. And if you look at the distribution of the gaps between nearest neighbor levels, nearest neighbor re resonances, you see that the probability of having small gaps is very low. 
And this uh, can be compared to random matrices uh, where the distribution looks exactly like this. And I think this is the solid line um, obtained from three by three matrices uh, in this case. So this was um, one first maybe slightly surprising uh, uh, realization that it, it is actually possible to find properties in real physical systems which uh, are very, very close to random matrix uh, statistics. And of course, what this also means is that it's, very, it's basically hopeless to try to get further structure from such uh, systems. Um, and they, they are really, um, at, at some level, have, have random features. But of course, uh, the, the detailed um, properties, for example, which ensemble of random matrices uh, should be applied still play a, a role and uh, in, in this case um, what is important is the symmetries of the system for example if whether or not the system is time reversal symmetric determines which of which random matrix ensemble you have to use um, the second uh, example i want to briefly mention is um, um, the the question how generic isolated quantum many body systems can reach thermal equilibrium because this question can also be answered in a way by using a random matrix theory, which is now um, known as under the name of eigenstate thermalization hypothesis. And uh, just, I don't, I don't want to go into uh, much depth here, but uh, the essential um, mechanism, how this works is that the local information about the initial state in a quantum many body system is scrambled uh, as a function of time. And this happens due to a special local structure in the many body eigenstates. Um, and this structure can be compared to random matrices. And um, uh, this, this was basically historically the way how people figured out an ansatz, and this is the ETH for the matrix elements of a local operator in the eigenbasis of the many body Hamiltonian. And uh, if you look at this function, uh, many of you will know this, um, you, you see that um, these matrix elements are given by some diagonal contribution and an off diagonal contribution, which contains the dynamics. And um, except for the energy structure, which is of course not present in random matrices, the, the form, the overall form of this ansatz is exactly, can be rigorously derived in random matrix theory and the thing which, which a real system has on top of that is uh, a structure in energy. And that, that generates all the features that a, a real system has. Um, and one example which has this uh, eigenstate uh, thermalization hypothesis, hypothesis is um, just a spin chain with uh, interactions between neighboring spins uh, subject to some disorder um, term in this case, disordered magnetic field. And if the field is weak, then this follows uh, eigenstate thermalization hypothesis in a way that um, if you take all the eigenstates of the system and um, calculate an um, expectation value of a local operator, in this case, the spin uh, as that component uh, at site zero in these eigenvalues and plot versus the energy, you will get a basically smooth function of energy with some no noise on top of it, of, of it. And the noise is exactly predicted by random matrix theory. And uh, this example has, uh, of course, uh, many of you know also this, uh, a nice property that if you turn on the disorders uh, um, beyond a certain critical strength, then you have a phase transition uh, to uh, a strong disorder phase, which is called many body localized. And in this phase, uh, this eigenstate thermalization hypothesis does not work and the system does not thermalize. Okay, so I, I want to keep it at this uh, very brief uh, motivation. Uh, and I just want to argue that random matrix theory in a certain sense is a quite successful way of characterizing generic properties of uh, many body systems. Um, and of course, there are always exam examples which are exceptions to these uh, properties. But the point is that these, these uh, situations are rare if you go through all possible uh, many body systems. Most systems will behave uh, according to random matrix theory. 
And with this, um, I want to move to open quantum systems and I want to see whether we can uh, apply random matrix theory to these kinds of systems. <clears throat> but maybe, maybe we can just hold for a second if in case there are any questions at this stage. If not, uh, we'll continue. Okay, so an open quantum system is different from what I just said in a sense that I want to focus on a system which is embedded in an environment and I don't want to explicitly deal with the environment. What this means is then that um, a quantum state um, has no, no longer a constant purity, but it should be described by a mixed state instead. And therefore the central uh, um, quantity instead of the wave function is now the density matrix of the system. Generally, of course, the density matrix is time dependent. And then we are interested in describing the, the dynamics of the system um, and the time dependence. And then, of course, things become very quickly, very uh, tricky how to describe exactly the time dependence. But here I want to just take the simplest case, uh, simplest possible case, and I want to use the Lindblad master equation. Um, what this does is that I will impose a Markovian approximation, meaning that I will not allow any memory in the, in the environment. And therefore, of course, many strongly coupled systems will not uh, uh, be well described by this equation, but um, at this stage, I don't really care. Um, so I will just impose this approximation and I will start from the Lindblad equation. Um, if you look at the Lindblad equation, and for those of you who are maybe not that familiar with it, uh, you will recognize that it uh, describes the time evolution of the density matrix by a piece which you, we all know, this is the, the part of the Lindblad equation, which is the same in unitary dynamics, described by a Hamiltonian. And then a piece which uh, is new in open quantum systems and describes dissipation and uh, is responsible for the loss of purity of the state. Um, and this piece uh, contains operators LN and LM, which uh, describe process, dissipation processes uh, which uh, generate the loss of purity. Um, and these dissipation channels can be in principle coupled in a non-trivial way by what is called the Kosakowski matrix. Uh, so this, this um, contains all the information about the interactions between the uh, dissipation channels. And uh, I want to now consider the generic properties of such a system described by a Lindblad equation with generic Lindblad operators and generic Kosakowski matrix. Um, maybe I should mention um, why, why is the Lindblad equation a reasonable starting point? Well, uh, it, it is the most general equation which generically preserves the property of the density matrix, meaning that as a function of time, the density matrix will always uh, preserve its trace and will always have positive uh, eigenvalues and therefore it is a reasonable uh, dynamics. It describes a reasonable dynamics um, dis uh, despite the lack of uh, memory in the environment. Okay, um, we can simplify this equation a little bit just to, uh, by introducing new notation and we will just describe the time evolution of a density matrix by a super operator which we call the Liouvillian. Okay, so the super operator maps a density matrix um, to its derivative and is therefore an operator which acts on the space of density matrices. Uh, so now if you have a spin chain, for example, which has a Hilbert space, which has a size of L spins, then the Hilbert space, and if you have spins one half, is maybe two to the power L. Uh, but the size of the density matrix is two to the power L times two to the power L. And therefore, um, if you vectorize the density matrix, the Liouvillian acts on a space uh, uh, which is of the size of uh, four to the power L, or two to the power two L. Um, there is also a Heisenberg picture uh, where you can just replace states by operators. And this will give you an adjoint Liouvillian and it has basically plays the same role. Uh, it has minor details in the equation which are different. And now the, the main question I want to address is what are generic features of many body Liouvillians? 
Um, so the first thing, of course, we want to do is we compare uh, the spectrum of a random Jovellian, literally random, meaning uh, we allow all possible uh, dissipation channels. This means we, we introduce a full basis of Lindblad operators. Um, this means uh, we have two to the um, uh, we have four to the power L possible Lindblad operators minus one because identity we, we don't include. And uh, then we allow a, a, a random matrix, random Kosakowski matrix, which couples all these possible channels in a generic way, right? So this means we basically have a four to the L minus one squared matrix um, for all possible channels. And we compare this to a completely random matrix which uh, is in general non-Hermitian because the Levillian is in general a non-Hermitian matrix. And if we just look at the spectrum, uh, we notice already a uh, quite striking difference. So the spectrum of a non-Hermitian random matrix is plotted here, and it has the generic feature that it lives uh, inside a disk. Um, the radius of the disk is given by the scales of the matrix elements, it's not, not so important. But you see that basically you have a uniform density of eigenvalues inside a disk on the, on the complex plane uh, centered at zero, right? So this is, if you just generate a random matrix, which is non-Hermitian, you will get such a spectrum. Instead, if you take a random Liouvillian, which uh, has a Kosakowski matrix, which is also random, but it has to have positive eigenvalues, in order to, to make the, the, the object you generate a Liouvillian, then you will get a different spectrum. And this was uh, uh, described uh, in this very nice PRL by Sergei Denisov and uh, collaborators, as well as in a, in a second independent work by uh, Sa and uh, I think Tomasz Prozen is also one of the authors. Um, and it was found that the spectrum has the form that is plotted here which they call a lemon. Now, um, don't uh, worry about the, the scales here. Uh, you should remember that uh, because a Liouvillian has to map a density matrix to a density matrix and should preserve the trace, um, the spectrum is complex in general, but the real part of all eigenvalues is either zero or negative. So what is not plotted here is zero is somewhere here, and all this, all this support of the spectrum is in the negative uh, real part. The real axis is uh, this white line here and has actually a higher density of eigenvalues. And what is interesting is that they could, I think, analytically uh, derive the boundary of the spectrum, so, so the support of the spectrum, and there are no eigenvalues outside of this limb. So very interesting and striking difference from a completely random matrix um, just by making the matrix random uh, and trace preserving and positive. Okay. David, I have a question. Please. So you're saying the lemon, um, there is the stationary state, which would be at zero. It would be is, here, yes. There is a gap to the lemon. Yes. Okay. There is a gap to the lemon. I believe it scales as one over the size of the Hilbert space. So the gap uh, decreases as you increase the Hilbert space. Thanks. Yeah. Um, what is also very interesting is that um, um, one can also consider the classical case. Um, the classical analogous to the Lindblad equation would be just a classical master equation, which um, has, of course, uh, in general, if you have a state vector, it has a matrix which maps uh, which describes the time derivative of state vectors. And if you consider the classical master equations, you get instead of a lemon, a spindle, which uh, has slightly longer tips at the end here. Okay. So it's similar, but, uh, but uh, a little bit different. Okay, so this, this is the case of completely generic uh, Liouvillians, which, uh, which, which have the only constraint that they have to be Liouvillians in the sense of uh, they have to preserve positivity and, tr and the trace. Uh, now the step we wanted to make is 
what happens if we constrain the allowed Lindblad operators to a set which, uh, which is local. And if you think about the completely generic uh, um, Liouvillian, you realize that in order to make it uh, uh, the, the case that was studied in, in, the, in these papers here, you have to allow dissipation processes which act at the same time in the whole system. For example, let's say we have a spin chain of 10 spins, then the basis of operators which is included includes uh, dissipation pro uh, operators which, which act simultaneously on all 10 spins. This seems rather unphysical, right? I mean, you might, you might um, agree that uh, maybe you can have dissipation processes which act at the same time at two sites or maybe even at three sites, but an extensive number, an extensive operator seems uh, slightly unlikely. Therefore, uh, this is the motivation to include locality. So how, how, do, I, how do I do this? Uh, let, me, let me maybe be slightly technical and, and explain in detail how, how we defined locality. In fact, in the paper, we discussed two types of locality. Uh, in the talk, I will only focus on one because, um, because it's conceptually the same thing. So what, um, what you can always do is you can write any operator and we will always focus on spin one half chains just for simplicity. You can write any operator as a tensor product of, of uh, Pauli matrices. So you have L Pauli matrices, which are, have a Kronecker product between them. And uh, this is called a Pauli string. Now um, you see that I allow uh, indices one, two, three. So that's sigma X, sigma Y, and sigma Z. But I also allow the index zero, which is identity. So sigma zero will be always identity. Um, and then I can have an example, uh, which is illustrated down here, of a, a chain of six spins. And in this example, I have chosen to put an identity on three of the sites and a non-identity Pauli matrix on the other sides. So um, I would call this a three local operator because it has three non-identity, so non-trivial Pauli operators. Um, and you, you will see if you think of this as a one dimensional chain, it is not spatially local. So this example, uh, there is an operator acting uh, at a site which is far away from the other sites. So, so it's not necessarily spatially local. Um, and, and this is exactly the distinction that we make in the paper. So we discuss first k-local Liouvillians, where the only thing which is important is how many non-trivial Pauli operators we, we allow at the same time. And in the end, we, we also discuss spatially local, uh, the spatially local case, which is slightly more complex and uh, gives an even more complicated hierarchy of um, timescales, but but the mechanism is the same. Therefore, let me just focus on k-local Liouvillians in this, in this talk for simplicity, okay? Um, so the main idea is that uh, in nature, um, most interactions we know are uh, two-body. Uh, basically, all of interactions we know are two-body, but th there can be more complicated uh, um, interactions if they're mediated by some more complicated mechanism. But I guess the most important case we will consider is the two local case. Um, the other uh, simplification we make is that we, we say we don't care about the Hamiltonian. So what we will do is we will set the Hamiltonian to zero and only consider the dissipative part of the Liouvillian, right? So then the Liouvillian will look like this. It will not contain a Hamiltonian piece. It will contain a Kosakowski matrix and it will uh, contain all Lindblad operators, which are up, which contain up to a, a maximal number of non-identity Pauli matrices. So, if, if for example, I start, and the most interesting and, and the case I will discuss most is the two local case. I will allow all Lindblad operators which act on one side, and I will allow all Lindblad operators which act on two sides, and I will exclude everything else. So this is this NL, this is the number of allowed Lindblad operators which have the, uh, which are subject to this locality constraint. Um, is this sufficiently clear? Okay, no objections, so 
<laughs> okay, so now if we do this, here is the spectrum we get. Um, I take a generic K local Liouvillean and let me start by case F. So this is a six site spin chain. And if I allow all Lindblad operators up to six bodies, so they act up to, on up to six sites, and obviously I will have the full basis of operators and therefore should recover the fully random case um, that I uh, showed you in the beginning. So this is just as a sanity check. If we, get, if we allow all possible operators in the operator space, we get uh, the case of a random Liouvillean. Much more interestingly, if we allow only up to two body dissipation processes, we get instead a very, very different spectrum. And note, we never plot up to the real part of zero. So there's always an eigenvalue, which is zero. But okay, this is, this is not interesting, right? So we start plotting at the first eigenvalue, which is not zero. And you see that uh, instead of one lemon, we get a set of clusters of eigenvalues, some of which seem to be very well separated. So that's very interesting. And that is exactly the phenomenology I want to discuss uh, in the remainder of the talk. Now, if you increase the range of uh, the allowed operators in, in the k-local complexity theory sense, for example, three body, the number of eigenvalue uh, clusters changes and um, also the distances. But what, what remains is that there is a distinct set of eigenvalue clusters and there is more than one, right? <clears throat> Let me just mention um, that uh, we include here a random matrix, random Kosakowski matrix, and we deliberately make it such that its eigenvalues have Poisson statistics. And I will argue in a second, I will explain in a second why. Uh, so this K matrix is random and uh, everything else includes the full basis of K local operators, right? Um, okay, so the first thing we uh, investigate before we go to the origin of the number of the cluster of the, the spectrum is can we understand uh, the, the dense parts of the spectrum in terms of random matrix theory? So we want to know, is the statistics of gaps the same as in random matrices? Um, and uh, you see here um, an example of the spectrum and the boxes are some regions which we, of eigenvalues which we consider. And what we do is we basically always take one eigenvalue and, and look for the two closest eigenvalues and calculate this complex um, gap uh, parameter if you want. So that's a direct generalization of what is done in, in real spectra. And we compare this statistic with the case of completely random uh, non-hemission matrices, which are, uh, which is this Ginebra ensemble, uh, which is uh, uh, of course uh, very well known in the, in the literature. And you can see that all the distributions that I show here are basically the same. Uh, so this confirms, uh, and the different distributions are basically just this different parts of the spectrum. So in, in, in particular, what this confirms is that uh, these two mer seemingly merged eigenvalue clusters in the region where they overlap uh, show also random matrix statistics, which means that the clusters merge and don't overlap uh, uh, independently. Um, okay, so, so we get random matrix statistics of the spectrum despite in putting in uh, Poisson statistics Kosakowski matrix, okay? So that's why we, we thought it's a, it's a stronger uh, result if, if you start from non-random matrix statistics and get random matrix statistics in the end, uh, rather than uh, putting in random matrix statistics and getting it out. Okay, so that's, that's the first thing. And uh, now, of course, it is uh, a very pressing question what is the origin of this clustering of eigenvalues? Um, and the key to this was basically we thought um, um, since the allowed processes in our Liouvillean are local, we should look also at the eigenvectors corresponding to the eigenvalues in terms of this kind of locality. And how do you do this? Well, you get um, four to the power L eigenvalues of the Liouvillean and each eigenvalue has an, uh, an 
uh, corresponding eigenvector. So in this case, it's non-Hermitian matrices. So we, we are looking at the right eigenvectors of the Liouvillian. And these eigenvectors are essentially something like density matrices, not really, because the trace of most of them is zero, only the trace of the steady state is one. Uh, so it's better to call them decay modes. But if we look at these eigen states of the Liouvillian, these decay modes rho i, we can of course calculate expectation values of any operator we like. And uh, in order to make progress, we take operators which have a certain locality property. So let's start in the upper left panel, um, where we take a one body operator, uh, any, uh, basically a random one body operator, and we calculate this expectation value for all eigenstates we get of the Liouvillian. And the result is the color in this plot. Okay, unfortunately here, um, you have to look very closely because uh, the cluster which, which has a different color is very small and covered by this red dot, but it, it'll be clearer in the next thing. So essentially what happens is that all these eigenvalues in these clusters, they don't contribute to one body observables only eigenvalues in this cluster do, and they, they are yellow, but covered by a red dot. Let's go to two body operators. So if we take, and, and remember the Liouvillian in this case was, uh, had only two body decay processes, uh, only two body dissipation. So we take two body observables, and again calculate this uh, contribution of any decay mode to this observable and color the eigenvalues accordingly. Now another cluster lights up, the second cluster, whereas the other clusters contribute basically zero. Next, we go to three body and you can see already the next cluster lights up and contains all the content that describes basically how a three body observables decay, um, whereas the other clusters don't contribute. Things get a bit more involved uh, if we go to four, five, six body operators, because now uh, while there is still a distinct part of the spectrum which lights up, it is, lies now in this merged uh, eigenvalue cluster, so it, things are, are a bit harder to understand. But uh, basically, it seems to continue. The real part of the eigenvalues correspond, um, corresponding to higher order operators is more negative. Um, up to some point when we go from seven body to eight body, and this is an eight site system, where it seems that the real part goes back the other, the other way, right? So, so then at some point, the, the direction where in which the eigenvalue cluster changes uh, reverses, and uh, this is, you can call it some turn back of, uh, of the dominant uh, eigenvalues. Okay, so, so basically we observe with this that uh, the clustering of the eigenvalues of the Liouvillian is organized by the locality of the corresponding eigenvectors. And uh, eigenvectors which correspond to a low number of non-trivial uh, Pauli matrices <clears throat> have a smaller real part in general, uh, or larger, sorry, smaller negative real part. Uh, but this, this direction st starts turning uh, the other way if you reach the size of the system. Um, I and, yes, please. Um, so the states that are towards the very right of your figures are the steady states, right? Is the steady state, right? So the steady state is not shown. I see, so you're not showing the steady state. Yes. Um, steady state in these things is always identity. And uh, because it's general, generic decay, right? And you, so you, the Hamiltonian is zero, so you can only decay to identity. I see, okay, that answers the question. Okay, thanks. And, uh, okay, then you could call this a zero body operator, right? Yeah, okay, no, because what I was trying to understand was um, that this rho i that you have is not really a, a proper density matrix. It's right? not a proper density matrix, that's correct. And, um, is there, is there a physical way of understanding uh, how to decompose the dynamics in terms of the other eigenstates of uh, the Liouvillian? I mean, had it been Hamiltonian evolution, I would have immediately decomposed my initial state into the eigenstates of the Hamiltonian and 
you can Sorry. decompose it in this. Uh, you can decompose it in these uh, uh, decay modes. No problem. The the thing is, you need to include the identity to to get the trace right, and that that tells you also that every initial state will decay to identity. Yeah, sure, but don't you face issues with normalization, orth ortho orthogonalization, and so on? Because uh, the orthogonalization in terms of these super vectors is not how it is for Hamiltonian innovation. Uh, remember, this is uh, a non Hermitian matrix, so I think the decay modes are not necessarily orthogonal. <laughs> yes, uh, which, is why, which is why my question that why should I think of this as uh, uh, why should I think of this as decomposition of the dynamics into some modes which are. Mm. Can I? Well, I think it works, it works because of this uh, phenomenology. So, um, yeah, Juan, you wanted to. So let me follow up on the, on the question and then and, and phrase it in my own words. So you have a so you have a non-hermitian matrix operator right. here. So you have right and left eigenvalue yes. eigenstates, okay? And what you're calling here ro rho of i is are the right eigenstates. Yes. And then you're doing you know you're tracing them with operators. Yes. So there is there is an orthogonality structure in terms of right and left eigen yes. eigenstates. Such that um, you know right and left eigenstates can you know can be found to be orthogonal, in in the sense that for each right eigenstate there is a left eigenstate. Right. So my interpretation of these results is that what you're showing here is that the left eigenstates of 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 these uh, of the eigenvector of of the eigenstates that you, of of these excited eigenstates that you're showing in terms of clusters have a certain structure. So the, you know the the first class if the first cluster is related you know the, the left eigenstates will be compo will be constructed out of you know one local operators and the second cluster left eigenstates composed of two local operators and so on and so forth. So I, I think that that statement is correct. Right. right. So and one way to think of this is that the 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 right eigenstate tells you the shape of the density matrix if you evolve it in time decaying at different speeds. Um, and the left eigenstate is like the basin of attraction of of those um, of those states because it's the object you need to use to 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 extract the component of the initial state in each right eigenstate is a left eigenstate. So I think that that's the structure that you're in, showing. In a way, yes, but I think there's even a simpler uh, thing which we realized after having done it this way, uh -huh. and this is by using the adjoint Liouvillian. Yeah, because the adjoint Liouvillian has right eigenvectors, which are the left eigenvectors of the Liouvillian. Yeah, of course. Right, which means that the adjoint Liouvillian describes the, the dynamics of an operator. Therefore, the uh, the eigenvectors, the right eigenvectors of an adjoint Liouvillian, are uh, in the operator basis. So they are components of these operators, and if you if you use those. Then you can directly decompose um, the right eigenvectors of the adjoint Liouvillian or the left eigenvectors of the Liouvillian in the in the Pauli string basis, and you get directly the locality hierarchy. Yeah, sure. Just, I, we just figured this out after having done it this yeah. way, but I think it's equivalent. So I, I agree. I was just making the point of checking that my understanding of your picture in terms of left, right, and left eigenvectors is correct. Thanks. Um, sorry, but uh, just I mean. I'm, I'm a bit more confused now because does this mean that if you give me all the right eigenvectors of the Liouvillian, I can somehow reconstruct all the left eigenvectors as well? Uh, no, mm, I don't think um, so. So, so this picture has information only of the right eigenvectors. So, how can you say anything about so, that? So, the point the point is the following: I get the, the same. So, the hierarchy is so gen, so the the hierarchy and n body uh, operators. It's so general that it is in both the right and left eigenvectors of the Liouvillian. It, you can see the hierarchy in both, but the eigenvectors themselves are, I think, uh, independent. So you need to calculate them both, uh, yeah. both sets. Okay. It might become a bit clearer uh, if I go on. Yeah. Okay. Um, so in order to just um, okay, so so one one thing I want to say is um, if you observe this uh, phenomenology that uh, eigenvalues in one cluster 
basically describe all the properties of three body operators. And in another cluster, they describe all the properties of two body operators. If you look at the time evolution, how the time evolution of an operator uh, expectation value de uh, depends on the, can be decomposed in the, in the spectrum of the Liouvillian, you realize that basically the real part of these eigenvalues governs the, the overall decay uh, time scale. Therefore, from this observation, you would conclude that a two-body observable should decay at a different rate compared to a three-body observable. So in order to check this uh, independently of the spectral analysis, and also in order to be able to go to larger system sizes, <coughs> this is exactly what we did. So we prepared an initial state, <coughs> which is just a product state of um, up and down configurations in our spin chain. And then we take a random n body operator. So for example, a random one body operator is a superposition of all one body operators, which you can define a full basis of one body operators. And then we look at how this uh, operator decays. And uh, so these lines are just a numerical result of the decay of random n body operators organized by n. So the first line is one body operator decay, second line is two body operator decay, and so on. And you can see very clearly that the, it is dominantly exponentially decaying um, with a rate which we can fit. So this is gamma f. And now we can of course also, and, and uh, I will show you in a second that we can calculate analytically the position of the eigenvalue clusters. And this is gamma A, so you can analytically calculate from the spectral analysis, and I'll explain in a second how, this, how we do this, uh, the position of the red dot, and we can compare this to the fit. And uh, you see that the fit and the analytical prediction match uh, extremely well. The, the analytical result is the gray dashed lines. Um, so this confirms the picture that um, observables decay at different rates, um, and the rate is given, is, is determined by the locality of the observable. Now the question is, of course, why is this? How, how does it come about? And this can be understood uh, in uh, using perturbation theory. Um, so, um, and, th and this, this basically uh, uses the, the, the thing that we just discussed. So for the perturbation theory, it, it is much easier to use the adjoint Liouvillian whose eigenvectors are operators. Uh, and you can, in principle, understand them. Uh, you can expand them in a Pauli string basis. So again, I use Pauli strings as I in introduced before. Uh, I call them SX and the vector X encodes the string. Um, and the crucial thing is that one should use a complete basis of Pauli strings and organize them by their locality. So there's one one by one block, which has the zero body operator. So that's just identity. Then there is a block, which is uh, 3L by 3L, which is all possible one body operators. So you put on one side, you put a non-identity Pauli matrix and on the rest, you put identity. Um, and now you can look at the matrix elements of the adjoint Liouvillian in the Pauli string basis. Uh, it turns out that uh, the properties of the Kosakowski matrix are crucial. Because if, if you consider the Kosakowski matrix as a completely random matrix, which has to be positive semi-definite in order to, uh, to make the Liouvillian a Liouvillian, then it turns out that the mean of the diagonal elements is finite and proportional to the number of this, this depends, of course, on normalization, but proportional to the number of Lindblad operators, whereas the mean of off-diagonals is zero. And the standard deviation of the off-diagonals is much smaller than the mean of the diagonals. This means that essentially the Kosakowski matrix, uh, and you can derive this directly from, from uh, random matrix theory, is uh, diagonal, diagonally dominant. So we have basically, we can write the Kosakowski as a constant times identity in, um, and this is crucial, um, a constant times identity plus um, um, 
a small, completely random part, okay? And this part is small. So we will do perturbation theory in a sense that we will consider K prime as a perturbation. If you take a diagonal proportional to identity Kosakowski matrix, then you can of course already imagine that you can simplify massively the, the, uh, the uh, matrix elements of the adjoint Liouvillian. And what you find is um, a diagonal matrix, which is organized by blocks given by the locality of the operators. In other words, the adjoint Liouvillian looks like this. There is a block which is one all one body operators and has the, all have the same value on the diagonal. Then there's a two body block with a different value on the diagonal, three body and so on. And on top of this, there is a noise which is small, which is completely off diagonal. Uh, therefore, of course, we can do a perturbation theory. So we do the unperturbed problem K prime is zero, which tells me that the eigenvalues of the Liouvillian are all the same in one body sector. They're all the same, but different from one body in the two body sector and so on. In other words, I can predict the position of the center of the eigenvalue cluster using uh, the diagonal part of the Kosakowski matrix. Now, if we do perturbation theory, I have to solve uh, the, the eigenvalue problem inside the block, which is degenerate, to lift the degeneracy. And this, since this has basically a structure similar to a random Liouvillian, uh, it will lift the degeneracy in the same way as a completely random Liouvillian. So there will be a mini lemon on top of the center which is predicted by the unperturbed problem. And this, this is the essence of it. So in the end, all of the um, phenomenology I discussed stems from the fact that the Kosakowski matrix, even if I make it random, has to be positive definite, which makes it automatically dominant in the diagonal. And therefore I can use this perturbation theory. Uh, and it works of course best for the small and best separated blocks um, and then I can predict exactly the center of the eigenvalue clusters. Question. Yes. So to check, I understand. So what you say is that um, you know the, the this K matrix is diagonal plus a perturbation. When it is just a diagonal, your operators are all orthogonal, right? And you have the one right. body, the two body, the three body, and all that determines the rate is 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 the bodiness in the sense yes. it will be one, two, three, four. So this way yes. you have these blocks, you know, they generate in one, they generate in two, they generate in three. That's, that's how it works. Then you perturb it and you get this mini lemon. Got you. Right. Thanks. That's it. In the end, once you know how it works, it's super, super simple. Uh, it took us a little bit to figure it out though. Um, so one question which, um, uh, and I think I should uh, start wrapping up uh, pretty soon, but one question I want to uh, mention in the end is, um, is so, so we observed in finite size uh, spectra that the one body eigenvalue cluster seems very well separated from the two body eigenvalue cluster and it's very well separated from the three body and so on. But since if I make the system bigger, of course the scales change and so on and also the number of clusters increases, um, can we make statements about how well separated the clusters are in the thermodynamic limit? And Using the perturbation theory, we can uh, try to answer this question. So in the left, in the left panel of this plot, um, I show the position of the n-body eigenvalue cluster. So that's from the leading, or, so the unperturbed problem, if you want, um, as a function of one over the system size. So the yellow curve is one body cluster, so the light green, first light green is two body and so on. And so you see, of course, for larger sizes, you get more and more clusters. They all move, um, and, so, and the cluster position is the real part of the, uh, of the eigenvalue. Uh, they all move towards zero, so they, in a sense, come closer to each other. Uh, but now we can also consider the width of the eigenvalue cluster and compare this to the distance. And we find, and that's the right panel, the distance of the first and the second eigenvalue cluster is the black curve. Uh, so it decreases, of course, with uh, system si increasing system size, but the width of these clusters decreases much faster. And hence, uh, we conclude that the, at least the first and second cluster remain well separated even in the thermodynamic limit. Um, 
With this, uh, I want to just briefly spend the last five minutes uh, on a very, as I said, ongoing, ongoing work uh, on trying to verify this in experiment. And uh, the idea uh, came to me uh, essentially during a talk uh, at EKS, which was excellent by Adam Smith, who uh, presented this work, uh, which is now published, trying to simulate a many body system on a quantum computer. And essentially the conclusion was that uh, while it's possible to observe um, quanti uh, qualitative features of many body system, it's very hard due to the noise of the machine to uh, have a quantitative uh, results com and compare them to theory. And while he was presenting this, we were already working on the theory I just presented to you. And I thought maybe we can use this noise as a generic n-body Liouvillian and try to use uh, the IBM quantum computer as a platform to study the decay of n-body observables. And uh, in a sense, what we try to do is we, we use the problems in quantum computing as a virtue for our problem um, and, you, and use it as a platform for generic open quantum systems, right? The nice thing is that there is this IBM uh, quantum experience, which is a cloud computing platform for quantum computing. Essentially, this means that it's an, a theorist's experiment because you can, without leaving your office, carry out experiments on such machines. There is an ensemble of machines. Um, most of them are five qubits, but there are also bigger ones, which means in a sense, we can also carry out random sampling over random Liouvillians. Um, and then the question is, of course, how random are they and, and so on. Um, so the general strategy we use is we uh, carry out a calculation on a quantum computer by in initializing an initial state then we wait. Uh, I'll tell you in a second what waiting means. And then we measure. And then you, in a quantum computer, you always carry out such an experiment many, many times and you average. Now, the zeroth order, and that was the, the initial idea of waiting is that the computer has intrinsic noise. So in, essentially it is already an open system. So you don't have to do anything you prepare an initial state, you don't do anything after, over some time, and then you measure. Uh, and this will just be equivalent to the action of the intrinsic machine Liouvillian. We don't know, of course, a priori, what are the properties of the machine Liouvillian, but the assumption is that uh, the, the dissipation processes are probably local in a sense that probably there's no dissipation which happens with an operator which acts at the same time on all five qubits. Okay, so that was initially the idea. We figured out, uh, and I'll show you the result in a second, that the intrinsic machine Liouvillian is essentially one body dissipation, hence uh, the least interesting case. And therefore we, we designed also a way of intru introducing two body dissipation to study the interesting separation of time scales. And the way to do this is by uh, changing the weighting circuit in a way that we apply two qubit gates, uh, namely the C0 gate, um, which, uh, which also introduces a very large error. And this error uh, we use to you know, generate as much dissipation, two body dissipation as we, as we want. So the C0 uh, circuit works in the following way. We apply an essentially random circuit to our initial state, n layers. Each layer consists of a random unitary on each qubit, and then a C0 gate on a random pair. Uh, we apply this, and then after some time, we reverse this uh, circuit and apply its inverse. So after applying this full circuit, we haven't done anything. The result is identity. And all that's all what has happened during this time is the errors of the gates, which of course have accumulated, and we cannot reverse those. So we reverse the unitary piece, but we don't, uh, we cannot do anything about the, the noise, and that's exactly what we want. So this allows us to get the two body uh, dissipation errors, which are dominant in the C0 gates. What we do is basically we measure the time evolution of a large set of Pauli strings, not really all, but many. 
um, which are organized by locality. And then we try to analyze the time traces of these observables and reconstruct the spectrum of the Liouvillian. So these are uh, results of basically not, uh, not a week old, so take them with a grain of salt. We are currently analyzing them. But this is uh, the spectrum we get if we reverse engineer the eigenvalues of the Liouvillian from the time traces using a technique called harmonic inversion. And uh, this uh, is the spectrum that we get if we don't do anything, we just wait. And if we compare this, uh, we have of course uh, done a bit, uh, start doing more sophisticated theory for this kind of things. But if we compare this to a theoretical prediction, the conclusion would be uh, what is also known in the quantum computing community, that the noise is predominantly one body. Now, if we apply the two body weighting circuit, we get, uh, um, due to the fact that the basis of Pauli strings we use to measure and the basis of eigenstates of the, of the Liouvillian are incompatible, the phases of the eigenvalue clusters cancel out. So we essentially get exponential decay, as I showed you in the theory plot uh, a while ago. Um, this means we cannot really reconstruct the imaginary parts of the spectrum of the Liouvillian. However, we can try to reconstruct the real parts of the spectrum. And if we take one body observables, then we get the first row of eigenvalues if we reconstruct them. For two body observables, we get the next uh, set of results, three body, four body, five body. And if we look at the center, and we actually even have uh, better results by now, which are confirming the point I make here. Um, but if we look at the centers of these eigenvalue clusters and note that there is, uh, there's more eigenvalues here than here, uh, then uh, the position of the centers track perfectly the theoretical prediction from our perturbation theory. So we are pretty confident that our C0 weighting circuit introduces an effect which is essentially the same as a random two-body Liouvillian and matches the theory expectation uh, for the position for the rates of decay of n-body observables. Um, with this, I would like to conclude um, and uh, allow those of you who want to leave uh, to leave. And uh, want to, I hope that I convinced you that local random Liouvillians exhibit a hierarchy of decay timescales of observables organized by locality, and that we can reproduce this prediction in the IBM quantum computer by hacking it to use it as an experimental platform for open quantum systems. Thank you very much for your attention, and I'm very happy to take any questions you might have. Thank you, David. Um, yeah, so I think everybody who needs to leave, you know, you're free to do so now. Uh, is there a, otherwise, if, if anybody has any question, now now is your chance. Yeah. So uh, hi, I'm Juan. Uh, do do you know what happens if you add an Hamiltonian part? Do you expect this can spoil the structure you find? Um, I think it depends a little bit, but uh, what happens with the Hamiltonian to some extent um, was studied in one of the papers I mentioned for completely random Liouvillians. Mm -hmm. And um, essentially what it does is, um, if you look at the master equation, the Hamiltonian piece has an I in front. So yeah. if you just look at the eigenvalues of the Hamiltonian piece, they are completely imaginary. So they are on the imaginary axis. Mm -hmm. And if you combine these things, then, then uh, it reproduces, it replicates the spectrum also in imaginary direction. Um, it depends on the Hamiltonian, um, whether it it's, will spoil um, the, the spectrum, uh, the spectral properties that, that we uh, discussed, but, um, I think in, in most cases, it could in principle be understood in the same way uh, using the perturbation theory I discussed. Um, so, um, but okay, one has to study it in the particular cases to make um, clearer. David, uh, could I comment on that? Please, uh, please. Because, um, so hello, uh, I'm Oscar Mill, uh, currently work on this. Uh, so it's very preliminary. But essentially what you do is if you don't have a random Hamiltonian, but if you already know the Hamiltonian to at least um, with relative accuracy. 
usually what, uh, at least if your Hamiltonian is much bigger than the decay time scales, so your Hamiltonian interaction traits are bigger than decay time scales, then what you would do is you do the perturbation theory starting off in the eigenstates of the Hamiltonian and then do the perturbation theory. And then you can use the same method for the results might vary. Um, and this is, uh, yeah. But whether, whether the hierarchy persists is, is, depends a lot on how the Hamiltonian looks. Okay, thanks. All right, does anybody else have any questions? Hello, uh, I'm Yichia. Thanks, David. Um, I think you have been focused on the relaxation time. Uh, can you tell me if, um, if, can we see anything from the random matrix to, uh, to see the fluctuations in a dynamic dynamics? Um, so I guess one, one aspect of the fluctuations is the size of the eigenvalue clusters, right? So if you, mm -hmm. um, if you look at the spectra, um, for example, here. So this eigenvalue cluster governs mm -hmm. the decay of three body operators. Mm -hmm. um, on average, if all eigenvalues uh, are active at the same weight, if you want, then the red dot, which is the center and prediction from the perturbation mm -hmm. theory, uh, would be the dominant uh, scale, right? Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, of course, uh, there are contributions of, of eigenvalues which have not all the same. Uh, real part. So these uh, contribute, of course, to fluctuations of this time scale. Mm -hmm. And uh, on the other hand, the extent in the imaginary direction uh, gives you oscillations. So, so, so I guess uh, maybe the, the way to, to try to understand uh, what you are asking is uh, in order to, uh, is basically to study the, the extent of the eigenvalue cluster. Then is there any relationship between the side of the cluster and its position? And between the and, and the center of it. The and the center. The, yeah. um, no, I, I don't think so. But um, the size of the cluster is, is very much influenced by the number of eigenvalues inside it. Okay. So you can easily count by combinatorics how many n-body operators exist. Uh, and this combinatorics gives you the number of eigenvalues and then um, uh, you you can uh, try to relate this uh, to the size of the to the extent of the cluster. I think I think it's basically uh, at least uh, at zeroth order you should it, you could expect that the density of eigenvalues is roughly constant. I mean you can see in the plots it's not exactly constant, but there is level repulsion between the eigenvalues, and the more eigenvalues you have, the larger the cluster gets. Okay, thank you. I have a sort of naive question somehow. I mean, so I, I probably should know this, but, and th this was discussed a bit earlier. Um, so if I have all the right eigenvectors of my Lewillian or the joint, anyway, if I have all the eigenvectors of one side, right? Now it's totally believable, you know, even without all the numerics, I mean, I'm happy to believe that the decay rates of the operators have to do with of Pauli of initial Pauli strings have to do with the k k locality of the Pauli string and sort of it's easy to see in special cases. What you show here is that this is true in general. But actually, okay, to, to easily to try to easily connect it to what happens to an actual initial state of a given sort of length of correlations, how would I go about finding the weight of an initial row that someone hands me onto a given decay mode as you called it? without knowing the left eigenvector. So do I need to know the left eigenvectors? I think if you have the right eigenvectors of the Liouvillian, then you should represent the initial state in that basis. Yeah, but you need the left eigenvectors to do the cross -road. Can I do this without the right, left eigenvectors? Right. Yeah. True. And I suppose what actually follows from this, I mean, I'm, I'm sure someone will correct me if, if this is wrong, but is that, it should be and probably is true that all this stuff that you found essentially for the right eigenvectors must be true for the left eigenvectors, right? I think so. But I mean, the, the reason is basically um, the plot you're seeing now is, is, was made by the right eigenvectors. 
the perturbation theory works best with the left eigenvectors or the right eigenvectors of the adjoint Liouvelian. And the red dots plotted here are the results from the perturbation theory. So, so these, these things match. And I think that locality present in right eigenvectors is also present in left eigenvectors. Actually, the eigenvalues are common, right? So that the eigenvalues are the same, yes. Thanks, that, that was a question too. Ah, okay. It yeah. was naive as promised, so. <laughs> All right. So, um, if if nobody has a uh, has any further questions, let let us. I I have one. Sorry, sorry. Please go ahead. Well, so you you've made a choice of how you build this random operator, this random generator, right? Right. The Louvillian, the Limbladian. So, what if instead of a generic k matrix, you take a diagonal one, which be which be the k rates all positive with some distribution. And you take random linear combinations of operators as your jump operators. You would have K N N, and then you have L L dagger, which are this you know, right. same operator, and they are random linear combinations. Of course, you know that can be written in the other way as well. But it's yes. it's kind of a choice of how you do the random the the, you know, right. the, the random sampling of of the operators. So exactly, um, isn't that um uh, you know wouldn't that be you know, in that case, you would understand that it's really dependent on how you distribute your 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 decay rates and how you choose these random linear combinations. Uh, in a, yes, uh, in principle, you're right. Of course, um, um, as you said, the only difference um, is um, the the distribution that you put in the in the ensemble of k matrices, right? Because you can can shovel over the basis rotation from Pauli strings to your, your basis that you want to use maybe, uh, and uh, absorb it in the K matrix. Um, but, uh, and, and, in, and if you do this, then, then everything is equivalent except for the ensemble of K matrices that you take. Sure. Now, um, we didn't, we only considered the case I discussed, but um, the paper by Sergei Denisov, um, they, uh, studied very carefully different choices for the sampling of the k-matrix. And what they observe is that basically the spectrum looks always the same. Okay. So it seems, at least for the fully random case, uh, the influence of the ensemble of k-matrices is, is quite small. Okay. And therefore, I guess it's reasonable to at least to expect that this same happens for, for our case. However, of course, uh, it would be uh, very nice to check uh, with another choice of, of ensemble. Okay. Right. Thanks. So do I interpret this correctly to mean that actually all, all of this should not be sensitive to the details of how you, what distribution you pick for K? Hopefully. <laughs> uh, I mean, maybe as a comment, I think the, if you take the L to be um, so if you take K to be diagonal with one of the diagonals and you take the K to be one body and actually all sigma Z, so just pure decoherence, then you can sort of analytically see that what, what you just showed is true. So, I mean, you can see that K local power of strings decay with three to the minus K times some. So I guess, well, actually, I guess you can, Ninja this into essentially for this case uh, for uh, that you said so if you have basically only one body dissipation the time scales are uh, essentially linear in the number of well that's right you, you can really see this analytically that's what I'm right. saying I was going to ask can you so that that's why I said the two body case is much more interesting in a sense that it has this turn back of the rates and and and, and structure uh, beyond linear uh, scale so that's why we wanted to have this in the experiment also. Thanks. Okay, does anybody else want to uh, ask anything? Well, if not, uh, you know, I'll thank David again. I'll stop the recording and then everybody can either leave or chat a bit because I am the host, so I can, I can keep this alive, uh, even if it's like wants to leave, that, that's what I was saying. And we can have an informal chat after this if anybody wants. Thanks a lot. It was a pleasure. Well, thanks to you. Thank you. Very nice.